So we are reading Hands of Light by Barbara Brennan. We are on chapter one second. Chapter seven, page number fifty-four of the book, and page number seventy-nine of the PDF. The, the cosmic cost. plane. The two levels above the seventh that I am able to see at this point are the eighth and ninth levels. They are each associated with the eighth and ninth chakras located above the head. Each level appears to be crystalline and composed of very fine, high vibrations. The eighth and ninth levels seem to follow the general pattern of alternating between substance, eighth level, and form, ninth level, in that the eighth appears mostly a fluid substance and the ninth appears to be a crystalline template of everything below it. I have not found references to these levels in the literature, although they may be there. I know very little about these levels except for certain very powerful healing practices that I have been taught by my guides. I will discuss these methods in chapter 22. So, <clears throat> so this is interesting. What she's saying is that the seventh chakra is on the head over here and we have two more chakras here. According to biogeometry, Dr. Abraham, there are actually three more chakras over here and we have in biogeometry something called the archetype ruler where you can actually test the chakras using the uh, BG3 uh, BG <coughs> and the BG16 uh, pendulums for the chakric energies, right? So what she's saying is that these higher chakras also exist. And this is something that I'm finding. They exist in premises also. They ex exist in people also. So if any of them are unbalanced, then there are methods of how to balance it. Perceiving the field. It is important to remember that as you open your clairvoyant vision, you will probably perceive only the first layers of the aura. You will also probably not be able to distinguish between layers. You will probably just see colors and forms. As you progress, you will sensitize yourself to higher and higher frequencies so that you can perceive the higher bodies. You will also be able to distinguish layers and be able to focus on the layer of your choice. So, so again, the point here becomes, right, that as your vision starts to systemize, you can see the higher layers, you can see the higher frequencies, right? Now, again, this would require a little bit of practice. It's not going to just happen overnight for you. But of course, we can use the Lekker antenna to test. We can use the BG3 pendulums to check. So there are various other means of checking also. It's not only that you have to see with your sight. Most of these illustrations in the next few chapters show only the lower three or four auric bodies. No distinction is made between the layers. They appear to be mixed within each other and act together in most of the interactions described. Most of the time we have our lower emotions, basic thinking processes and interpersonal feelings mixed together and confused. We are not very good at distinguishing them in ourselves. Some of that mixing even shows in the aura. Many times, the mental and emotional bodies appear to act as one confused form. So, <clears throat> we, we talked about the different layers of the aura, right? So, when we look at it, it was shown, uh, wait, I'll pull it up otherwise. So, the for, one second, just hang on, I'll just pull it up and I'll attempt to show it to you.
शिमला एम स्टॉपिंग योर शेयर एक बार okay so can you all see the uh, screen right so these are the different layers of the aura so th this is what she is talking about that these layers the first four layers appear to be very mixed so now the first layer is about the physical sensation the second layer is about the emotions the third layer is the rational mind the fourth layer is relationship with others so these are the fourth layers that she is talking about which are literally mixed with each other uh, okay now i i have been told that some people are not getting what we are talking about in this book so if you have any questions feel free to ask okay don't refrain yourself so that we can clear it clear the doubts clear what we are talking about otherwise it doesn't make sense to read the book is everyone clear with this what we are talking about the different layers of the aura bhaiya here i have one question so Oh, in this slide, you have written left brain uh, against the first four layers, right? Yeah. So this is related to the rational brain, right? When we start, because this is all rational, rationally decided stuff. When we get into the heart stuff, we get into the higher states of consciousness. That is why they say that the heart is the means to grow in spiritual. Uh, uh, spiritual growth comes from the heart, not from the brain. so then these other three levels under ecstasy that you are showing are the right brain they will be the right brain will come into the picture now okay because the heart <clears throat> doesn't uh, talk about me and you you understand it talks about us all the time so if you are operating from the heart you are not going to be selfish yeah anyone who operates from the heart do you find them to be selfish so that's the basic idea right when you get into divine connections then the selfishness and the self centeredness starts to drop and that's why you when we are see normally all of us are left brain oriented so what will you perceive when you are left brain oriented the first four layers of the aura right which are related to your direct living in this environment it is not going into higher states of consciousness so whenever we are going into higher states of consciousness we need to uh, click in with the heart shivangla you can share in the following descriptions of the therapeutic processes not much distinction is made in the bodies sure. however where are you you have to start with perceiving the field this is where it stop where is the Achoo. perceiving the field acha okay in processes not much distinction is in the following descriptions of the therapeutic processes not much distinction is made in the however through the therapeutic processes or any other growth process the layers of one's being becomes more distinct the client is much more able to distinguish between base emotions thought processes and the higher emotions of unconditional associate the higher this distinction occurs through the process of understanding the cause and effect relationships described in chapter 15 that is the client begins to understand how his belief system affects the ideas in the mental body how that in turn affects the emotions then the etheric and finally the physical body so when you look at this our belief systems our thinking process which is <clears throat> connected with the rational mind will affect the emotional and will affect the physical that's why when we do the meditations in the deck series you have the mental body then you have the emotional body and then you have the physical body <clears throat> so we are healing all of them and the belief systems are naturally mental constructs right so our belief system drives us the way that we are living life is actually driven by our belief systems 
So that thing starts to really drive us. So when we start perceiving the field, you will be able to start perceiving what is the belief system with which the person is operating from. With this understanding, with this understanding, one can then distinguish between layers of the auric field, the layers of the field actually become clearer and more distinct as the client becomes clearer with more self-understanding between physical feelings, emotional feelings and thoughts and acts accordingly. So now this, this statement also becomes very, very important, right? Again, you can look at it from the grid aspect also. Where are you operating from? Are you operating from the rational mind? Are you operating from the emotional side? Are you operating with a higher perspective? That can also start becoming uh, apparent to us. When we start actually understanding or I mean paying attention to where we are operating from. Later in the healing sections that follow, it will be very important to distinguish between the layers of the aura. Answers to the questions in exercises to see the human aura. The energy almost always moves from left to right around the circle. It feels very unpleasant to stop. And usually, it is impossible to stop the entire flow. The feeling of building something up between your hands is that of a tickling sensation with pressure, somewhat like static electricity. When the energy body edges touch each other, there is a feeling of tingling and of pressure. When the energy body edge touches the skin, there is a feeling of tickling and pressure on the skin surface. When you draw circles on the palm, you can feel the tickling outside of the circle. So <clears throat> now this is something that we are we, we do when you're doing the resonant tuning and when we are creating the reball, Robert Monroe asked us to spiral the field around us, right? So this is exactly what she's talking about. The energy is moving in a spiral around us, right? So when we focus on that, we actually start strengthening it during the exercise. Now, we also do this exercise of feeling the energy field, right? All of us felt it the other day. We press the center of our palms, then we press the fingertips, and we felt this tickling which was taking place. Did we do this exercise here? Will someone answer? We do it in the yes, excursion. Yes. Yes, yes. We yeah. have done so again, you can feel the tickling, right? That is exactly what she's talking about here. We've already done this exercise. Most people see a haze around the fingers and hands when trying to sense the aura. It looks somewhat like the heat wave over a radiator. It is sometimes seen in various colors such as blue tint, Usually, most people see it as colorless in the beginning. The energy bodies pull like taffy between the fingers as the haze from each fingertip connects to the haze at the fingertip of the opposite hand. When you move the fingers so that a different fingertip is facing it, the haze will at first follow the old finger and then jump to the closer fingertip. So just go back to the picture. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so this is what is, go Nietzsche. So again, when you start seeing it like this, first it will be straight, which you are seeing straight. Then if you shift your finger, you'll find it first sticks with the old one and then it shifts to the other one. That's what she's saying away. Okay, any questions anyone before we move into the next chapter? These questions you all can look at, but basically it's about the chakras and about the layers of the aura. So 
Shimang, let's stop the share once. If anyone has any questions, we can talk about it. Anyone, any questions, anything to ask or say on this last chapter that we went through? Actually, I just, my eyes went on one question that was there. Um, uh -huh. Just why is the chakra a specific color? So every color has a frequency of vibration. Okay. Right. Now, if the chakra is vibrating at a particular frequency and you're perceiving it with your eyes, you will perceive that color. Okay. So when we use the lecker antenna, we can check whether the chakra is working properly or not. We have to tune the chakra. Uh, we, we have to, in the meter, this is, see, this is the lecker antenna. Can you all see it? So we have a cursor here, which sets the frequency. So the frequency loop is set with this. There's a wire which connects the two rods and it gets cut off here. And then it goes into the handles, right? So when we are setting that particular frequency, we check on that frequency, whether it's working properly or not. So each of the chakras is vibrating at a particular frequency. And because of that, it can it is normally perceived at that particular color. Now, if it slows down or it doesn't move properly, then it becomes dirty, it becomes dark and all that stuff starts to happen, which I think we'll be talking about it in the coming sections. Any other question? No questions? Okay, then we'll move ahead. Part three, psychodynamics and the human energy field. The golden light of a candle flame sits upon the throne of its dark light that clings to the wick, the Zohar. So what does this mean? When you see a wick, there's always darkness near the wick and then the flame comes. So he's just seeing that the flame, there's darkness inside the flame from which the flame actually emits. So it's the blue section. We find that that blue section, that blue part of the flame is the most powerful part of the flame. So when we are rectifying rings, etc., we, we talk about it in the energy field and uh, uh, Vastu workshop, you can actually rectify a ring and it starts to sparkle. But we have to show it to the blue part of the flame. And that's when the it becomes most active, uh, effective to rectify. Introduction, the therapeutic experience. It was in the psychotherapeutic setting that I first consciously, as an adult, this was a setting where I was not only allowed to closely observe people, but I was also encouraged to do so. During my long hours of practice, I observed the dynamics of many people this was a real privilege because normal social ethics set very clear boundaries on such behavior. I'm sure you have all had the experience of getting interested in a particular stranger or on a bus or in a cafeteria when after only a short observation that person catches your eye and lets you know in no uncertain terms with a look that you had better stop looking. So, <clears throat> there was a book, you know, how do people know that someone is staring at you from behind your back? So, there was a lot of research done on this also, that people actually get a sense that someone is staring at them. So, this is what she is talking about here. Now, in the first place, how did he know you were looking? He felt you through the energy field. In the second, why did he tell you to stop? People get very nervous when they are seen. Most of us do not want our personal dynamics to be known by others. Most of us are ashamed of what will be seen if another human being looks closely. So why does this happen? Because all of us have a facade. Okay. The more false falsity that you carry around with you and the more uh, you are not yourself, you're not your true self, you're 
putting up an act you will be scared as to what people will see if you open yourself up so no one wants wants to be an open book everyone wants to be hidden they don't want people to know what they are thinking okay and this act takes up a lot of energy at the end of the day we all have problems we all try to hide at least some of them in this section i will discuss how our private experiences including our problems show up in the aura i will relate to body psychotherapy and to character structure as defined by bioenergetics but first let us start at the basis of psychotherapy with childhood development so again most of our energies most of our belief system most of our character is actually set when we are from the age of 1 to 6 right so that becomes important what are you interacting what are you seeing in that area how are your parents behaving around you what is their field telling you because children are very sensitive they can actually see the aura also there have been a lot of studies on human growth and development eric erickson is famous for his work on delineating stages of growth and development related to age these various stages have become a part of our everyday language such as the oral stage adolescence pubescence etc right so now <clears throat> this is again something that we discussed in magical child where you had the matrix system so everyone has to grow with the matrix system if you are not growing according to that you will end up creating problems so now this will be i think a great another way of looking at this this should be really wonderful and powerful let's see what she talks about none of these studies mention the aura for it is not known to most people in the field of psychology when observed however the aura is very informative about a person's psychological makeup and her personal growth process what is developing in the aura at any stage of growth is directly related to the psychological development at that stage so anything that comes into the physical first has to be formed in the etheric or in the auric stages and then it comes through the layers one after the other so if something is happening to us right now in the physical 3d environment that we live in it is already there in the auric field so someone who can actually see the auric field can actually discern that okay this is coming into your life in fact when looked at from the auric point of view that development can be seen as a natural outcome of what is happening in the auric fields let us look at how our energy field usually develops from birth to death it was in the psychotherapeutic setting that i first consciously she wanted started... to go down chapter 8 human growth and development in the aura to span the scope of human experience from birth to death and beyond i will utilize both psychological and metaphysical traditions as resources if the metaphysics disturbs you please take it as metaphor incarnation the process of incarnation takes a lifetime it is not something that happens at birth and is then finished to describe it we need to use metaphysical terms incarnation is organic soul movement in which higher finer vibrations or soul aspects are continually radiated downward through the finer auric bodies into the more dense ones and then finally into the physical body these successive energies are utilized by the individual in her growth throughout her life now <clears throat> 
So what is he saying? First, everything has to be created in the etheric level. Now, this is something that we experience very, very practically in the Lifeline program when we are doing soul retrieval. And there's this movie that we show in the Lifeline program called Astral City. In that, this shows up very clearly that today, a lot of planning goes into when we take an incarnation. So we actually have a life plan. We have a life goal that we are talking about, right? And then that plan is put into a, given to a planning center. That planning center coordinates everything that we are going to be experiencing in this lifetime. And then we start experiencing it. So the plan has to come from out there and then it slowly percolates down into our system and we are existing as we are existing right now. Okay. So <clears throat> even in biofield tuning, we start from the end of the auric field where we start from zero and then what we are is over here. What is your current age? And when we are doing the tuning through the, uh, through the timeline, we can actually discern what happened to you in your life throughout right so like that whatever is coming into our physical being in this 3d reality has to go through the auric system all the layers of the aura and they keep building on whatever is happening each major stage of life corresponds with new and higher vibrations and the activation of different chakras at each stage new energy and consciousness is thus available to the personality for her expansion. Each stage presents new areas of experience and learning. Seen from this point of view, life is full of exciting discovery and challenge to the soul. So what, what is she saying over here very clearly, right? The first chakra that gets activated is the Mooladhara. It is related to physical survival. <clears throat> it is relating to de developing our physicality, right? So without that physicality, suppose we suddenly go into the seventh chakra, which is mind awakening and all that stuff, and we've not had the grounding of the physical structure, the entire structure will collapse. So it is always a stage by stage development which takes place. The process of incarnating is directed by the higher self. This life pattern is held in the seventh layer of the aura. The Ketrick template level. It is a dynamic template which is constantly changing as the individual makes free will choices in the process of living and growing. As growth takes place, the individual opens her ability to sustain higher levels of vibrations, energies, consciousness coming into and through her vehicles the auric bodies and chakras. So <clears throat> when we saw the chakras, right, the chakras were like V shape and each of the chakras was also related to a, first phys uh, a level in the aura, right? Now, <clears throat> so when we are in the physical side, the first layer is activated. So the muladhara, the first activates. When we go into the second layer, the muladhara second layer activates and also the second chakras second layer activate and so on and so forth. And that's how we keep getting connected to the higher and higher levels of consciousness, the higher and higher levels of our own auric field, higher and higher levels of understanding and perception start to open up slowly. Thus, she avails herself of ever greater expanded realities as she progresses on her path of life. As each individual progresses, so does the whole of humanity. Each generation is usually able to sustain higher vibrations than the last, so that the whole of humanity moves in its evolutionary plan towards higher vibrations and expanded realities. So again, every... <clears throat> So there is something called the morphogenic field, right? We've talked about it before. It was coined by Rupert Sheldra. There's also DNA activation. There's a memory that is there in the DNA, right? So now a cultural significance, cultural habits, cultural characteristics are passed on by the DNA. So if one generation has learned something and second generation also learned something, by the time it comes to the third generation, it will be automatic, right? 
all these processes, the belief systems, the capacities, the nature of doing things, all get carried forward one at a time as we grow, right? Now, with each successful, each successive generation, you'll find that the person knows more because what the older generation learned is built into the DNA system, right? That's why you, you'll find that when we were growing up, we didn't know how to use a remote control. We didn't even know what a remote was. Today, if you see kids, like 10 years back kids, they knew how to operate the remote control. Today, you talk, you see toddlers, they'll, they'll start flipping on the phones. They'll start, they'll know how to get to their program that they want to go. So evolutionary changes are taking place and growth is taking place. Intelligence is taking place. You'll find that, you know, mothers can teach their children till, let's say, class four or five, and then they lose it because the syllabus is the kind of talk that is happening is beyond the capacity of the mothers because they've not done it. So how much the brain can retain, how much it is being able to perceive is growing with each and every generation that is going. So we are raising our level of vibratory frequency, although the flip side is also there where some people are going more in the dumps, but there is a group of people who are evolving into higher states of consciousness. And this is what we read in power versus force also that one person operating at the level of 700 can help the consciousness growth of 1 million people at the lower levels of consciousness. So it becomes our duty now to actually start raising our levels of consciousness, which is what she's talking over here, that as each generation is touching base with a higher vibratory frequency, the vibratory frequency of the entire human race is getting lifted up. This principle of progression of the human race is mentioned in many religious texts such as the Kabbalah, the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads and others. The incarnation process before conception has been discussed as Madam Blavatsky by Madam Blavatsky and more recently by Alice Bailey, Phoebe Bendit and Eva Pirakos. According to Pirakos, the incarnating soul meets with her spirit guides to plan the coming lifetime. So this is what I was saying, right? That before we incarnate, we actually plan what we want to learn, what we want to experience in this current lifetime. And then there's the concept of, you know, you go and you'll be judged what you did and all that. In whatever we are experiencing, it is basically when you go back, there's another movie called Defend Your Life, which this shows up very, very nicely and in a funny, in a, uh, in a comedy manner. But basically, what is it? You have something called the life review. You review your own life. Okay. And then you decide that, okay, this was my life plan and this is what I achieved. So you mark yourself and then you figure out for yourself, what did you miss out? And then you create a new life plan to come back if you would like to still grow in this earth life system. So in, in the Monroe process, this is called earth life system, right? And we plan here and come. That is why it is not possible to blame anyone for whatever is happening to you. We have to take responsibility for what is happening to us. In this meeting, the soul and the guides needs to accomplish in soul growth, what karma needs to be met and dealt with, and the negative belief system she needs to clear through experience. This life work is usually referred to as a person's task. So now again, when we look at the growth pattern that Robert Monroe talks about in the first talk, we saw that sheet the other day. In that, he clearly says that you have to get, you have to transcend your belief system. So here she's saying the same thing that whenever we are coming here, we want to grow. So how do we grow? By transcending our belief system and our belief systems will put the lagam on us. That is what restricts us. So we have to transcend our belief system. For example, the person may need to develop leadership. That person on entering into physical life will find himself in situations where leadership is a key issue. The circumstances for each person will be entirely different. 
but the focus would be on leadership. One person may be born into a family with rich leadership heritage, like a long line of respected company presidents or political leaders, whereas another person could be born into a family where leadership is non-existent and leaders are seen as negative authorities to be put down or rebelled against. The person's task is to learn to accept that issue in a balanced and comfortable way. So again, so we are deciding what we want to experience. And for that, the situation is created for us to be able to experience that experience so that it results in growth for us. According to Eva Pirakos, the amount of counseling a soul has from her guides is determining her future life circumstances depends on her maturity. Parents are chosen who will provide the needed environmental and physical experience. These choices... So, so, so over here, this is very important, right? We choose our own parents. It's very, very clear. We choose our own parents. We, we make the choice that, okay, I want to be born to this parent because it will serve our life goal. It will serve the purpose for which we are being born on this earth. Is the fifth line. Oh, sorry. It's the fifth line. These choices. Oh, I was already reading. I didn't realize it's not mute, uh, unmuted. These choices determine the mixture of energies that will eventually form the physical vehicle in which the soul will incarnate for its task. These energies are very precise and equip the soul with exactly what it needs for its task. The soul takes on both a personal task of personal learning like leadership and a world task which entails a gift to the world. The design is so unique that by fulfilling the personal task, one becomes prepared to fulfill the world task. The personal task frees the soul by releasing energies which are then used for the world task. So this is also cons what we are looking at in the basis of maturing, right? So whatever we are learning when we are youngsters, it prepares the ground for us to what we are going to be doing when we grow up. And when we grow up, we can have a profound effect on the world environment, on our immediate family, in our village, in our city, in our country, in our state. So what are we here for? What are we wanting to do that, and that determines our parents, that determines our environment, and that determines how your life will pan out, right? So we, again, need to take responsibility for whatever is happening to us because we are the ones who made that choice even before being born in this earth life system. For the example mentioned above, on leadership, the individual will need to learn that quality or skill before moving into a leadership role in her chosen field of work. She may have felt intimidated from a long line of ancestors who were brilliant leaders or her reaction to that heritage may be, the, may be one wholly of inspiration to go forward in her own leadership. Each case is different and very personal according to the uniqueness of the soul which has come to learn. So again, very, very clearly, right? Every one of us is unique. Every one of us has a unique life purpose and simply stated, right? We are here to fulfill that life purpose. Now, when we look at it from the Vedantic principle, Basically, you have the vasanas. The, they talk about the sanchit vasanas, which is your overall propensity. And you have the prarabdh vasanas, which is what you have come here in this life to achieve. Now, what they say in the Vedantic system is that once your prarabdh vasanas are exhausted, 
you leave this earth you don't stay in the earth anymore right so now many times people blame a daughter has died for example and because of certain circumstances so people start blaming themselves for the death of their daughter or their son or the death of their parent right we need to understand this very very clearly the point at which the prarabdh is over the person will transcend they will not remain here if there is some kind of a prarabdh left or they decide that i want to deal with some of our sanchit vasnas then they can hang on here for some time but generally speaking the prarabdh is over you will transcend no one can stop it so this is what she is saying over here the idea is of that growth that whatever we have come here to learn once we learn it we will exit that's it the life plan contains many probable realities which allow for wide choices of free will interwoven into this life fabric is the action of cause and effect we create our own reality this creation emerges from many different parts of our being so this is again important right at every point in time we have a choice now if at this point i make a choice i will go that way if i make the other choice i will go this way if i come this way this will become my lifeline if i go this way this will become my lifeline now all are existing at the same time so where we focus our attention that is where we will be there's these books called the immortals there's an author called shunya he explains this in a pretty dramatic manner he says that you know as an overview you have the view to see all the lifelines but once you engage in a lifeline and you get engrossed in a lifeline then you are engaged only in one lifetime but if you have the ability to raise your level of consciousness you can shift from one track to the other track right and that becomes very powerful because when we are going into these altered states we can actually shift our reality so this again comes into the concept of parallel universes what we were looking at in the uh, in that series uh, fringe right we parallel rea parallel uh, parallel reality is happening and all sorts of things coming from one reality to the other reality so this can actually start happening provided we are at that level of consciousness we create our own reality this creation emerges from many different parts of our being creation is not always easy to understand from a simple cause and effect level although much of our experience can be understood from that point of view you literally create what you want Hello. what you want is held in the consciousness unconsciousness and super consciousness and collective consciousness all these creative forces mix to create experience on many levels of our being as we progress through life what is termed karma is to me long term cause and effect also from many different levels of our being so again everything is imprinted at various levels and again what we were talking about vasnas is also karmically related so if you have if you've taken a particular action you need to feel the reverse of that action the opposite action so if i have experience being slapped i will want to experience slapping right that is what causes that cause and effect again my view of karma has taken a turn which i keep telling you all that if act if emotion is attached to an action then it becomes karma otherwise you are just fulfilling your life purpose of doing that particular action right it doesn't become a vasna if no no emotion is attached to the action all these creative forces mix to create experience on many levels of our being as we progress through life what is termed karma is to me long term cause and effect also from many different levels of our being thus we create from the personal source and group source and of course there are smaller groups within larger groups all adding to the great fabric of creative life experience 
so again soul groups right i want to experience a particular experience so people who are in my soul group will say okay i agree to help you to experience this experience and for that they will also incarnate to help me experience that experience right so for example when ram ji had to come here that's the story that when ram ji had to come sheshnag in the form of lakshman ji came shiv ji in the form of hanuman ji came and they met over here and then they performed the leela or performed the actions that they had to perform so they were supporting each other in experiencing the experience they wanted to experience from this point of view it is easy to look at the richness of life with the wonderment of a child after the planning the soul enters into a process of slowly losing consciousness of the spirit world so now this becomes very very important if you already know the plan then you are not going to be able to experience anything right so you have to you have to actually operate you have to forget that you actually came from that higher state of consciousness to be totally involved in the experience right so we say this that we started with that level of consciousness when we come to earth life reality our consciousness becomes like this and then the idea is that we at, what what are we attempting to do here we are attempting to expand that level of consciousness so we can become aware even in this earth life experience but whenever after that again your your understanding and experience becomes here where you go and do your life review so we lose slowly lose consciousness of the spirit world when we come into this lifetime at conception an energetic link is formed between the soul and the fertilized egg at this time an etheric womb also is formed which protects the incoming soul from any outer influences other than those of the mother so this becomes very important we are choosing our parents right so the egg is already fertilized now which soul will enter the egg is something that the soul decides to do and then the soul doesn't always stay in the egg it keeps coming and going right so when it's coming and going it needs to be protected so the womb is there and then etheric egg is also formed now that formation of the etheric egg inside the Uh, or, or around the womb you could say creates a field of energy and in bio geometry it has been seen that the the mother a, a pregnant mother is emitting bg3 frequencies that's why in most cultures a pregnant lady automatically becomes sacred and is looked after and that sacred energy is what is found in temples right and that energy has three components we talked about this before it has got the higher frequency of ultraviolet it has got the higher frequencies of gold and something called negative green which is the opposite of green the light green which is emitted these three combine in a particular uh, combination to emit something called bg3 biogeometry 3 frequency and all mothers emit this frequency right so that's why the mother becomes sacred as the body grows inside the mother the soul slowly begins to feel the drag of it and slowly becomes consciously connected to the body at one point the soul suddenly is aware of this connection there is a strong flash of conscious energy down into the forming body the soul then again loses consciousness only to reawaken bit by bit into the physical this strong flash of consciousness corresponds with the time of so again what does this imply right that the soul makes a connection with the body but it has time to decide whether it will be born in that in that baby or not right but once that decision is taken then the soul the soul and the physical form of the body they connect and in that process the soul suddenly the the baby's consciousness starts to evolve and the soul's consciousness or the connection with the spirit world starts to tend to come down
birth. Birth takes place at a unique time for the incoming soul. At this point, the soul loses its protective etheric womb and is for the first time subjected to of its environment. For the first time, alone in a sea of energy which surrounds all of us. It is touched by that field. The greater, stronger fields of the heavenly bodies also, for the first time, influence the soul's new energy field at the time of birth. And of course, it is at this time that the sea of energy is now influenced by another new field which adds to the greater and enriches it. It is as if another note is sounded and added to the already existing symphony of life. So we affect our environment and the environment will affect us. So as soon as the baby is born, it starts connecting with the universal field also. It, it becomes part of the field. So it can start influencing the field in fantastic manners. Right? So again, so over here, it clearly states that the time that you are born, you're losing that etheric shield. So that etheric shield is acting like a Faraday's cage, which is not allowing the outside influences to influence you. But as soon as that field is lost, you're imprinted with everything that is there, right? So this is what we talk about in astrology. That's why the time of the birth becomes important. When you leave the womb, you are imprinted with the influence of everything that is there around you. So we talked about this in the, in the magical child also, where natural birthing is a much better process of birthing than the mechanical birthing process that we are following in, in hospital environments nowadays. Simply because the effect of that environment will influence the way that the baby grows and the baby uh, baby's belief system and the entire character of the baby uh, manifests, right? Also, when you look at astrology, what is astrology? When you draw the chart, it is a position of the planets when you were born. So again, as soon as that etheric shield is removed, the influence of everything, the planets, your environment gets stuck on the baby because the baby is like a clean whiteboard. There is nothing written on that. So that imprint is what creates your character. Babyhood. The process of slowly awakening to the physical world continues after birth. The baby sleeps frequently during this time. The soul occupies its higher energy bodies. It leaves the physical and etheric bodies disengaged and allows them to be very busy doing the work of bodybuilding. So again, <clears throat> if we are consciously in, in integrating with the physical body, then the physical body cannot do the work that it needs to do. So that is why the body needs to have delta sleep every night. Otherwise, it can't heal itself. So it is said that every time we go into delta sleep, our conscious awareness goes into something called the night school, where we get out of the body and we are doing stuff away from the physical body. We are not connected to the physical body anymore when we get into deep and very deep sleep. Right. So it says over here, it the baby sleeps frequently during this time. The soul occupies its higher energy bodies. So higher energy bodies are out there, right? So it is out there. And this leaves the physical etheric bodies engaged in allowing them to build the physical body, right? So that's why you'll find that people who are sick, they cannot sleep well. So sleeping is a very, very important part of health, which these days we tend to kind of ignore. In the early stages of life, the child has the job of becoming used to the limitations of physical sensation and to the three-dimensional world. I have seen many newborns struggling with this process. They still have some awareness in the spiritual world and I have seen them struggling to let go 
of spiritual playmates and parent figures and to transfer affections to the new parents. So again, <clears throat> because the baby still has that subtlety and has an affinity to that spirit world, it is actually able to perceive the spirit world. Right? So connecting, see, whenever we are going also into F10 or F12 or into the higher focus levels, when we come back to the body, this body feels very gross and like moving, that freedom is not there. It feels very, very heavy, right? Because when we are in those higher states of consciousness, there is a lightness that is felt. There is a freedom that is felt, right? So again, the baby, because it's come from the spirit world into the physical body, has to struggle, has to deal, has to learn how to manage this physical body. Because over there, there was no physical body. The newborns I have observed have very wide open crown chakras, figure 8.1. They are struggling to squeeze themselves into the confinements of the tiny body of a baby. When I see them leave the physical body in their higher bodies, they appear many times to be spirits of about 12 feet tall. They go through an enormous struggle in opening the lower root chakra and connecting to the earth. So again, to live in this physical body, grounding, connecting with the earth is very, very important. That's why the first chakra to get activated is actually the Muladhara. It's the, the first chakra which connects us to the earth. This is something that we are finding in biofield tuning also. If the earth star and the sun star are not properly set, it becomes difficult for any kind of healing to take place for the person. One such example of this was a boy born one month later than expected. After a very fast birth, he had a fever. The doctors performed a spinal tap to check for encephalitis. The spinal tap was administered in the region of the sacral chakra. The child was struggling to let go of two playmates and a spirit woman who did not want to let go either. In his struggle, he would open and connect with the earth whenever his guide was present. Then he would lose contact with his guide, see his playmates and the woman and struggle fiercely between the two worlds. So again, we always have guidance. So we are getting guidance, but whether we take the guidance or not is something that we have free will to do. Whether we will take it or not depends on us. And of course, we, we everyone wants to stay with the familiar. People do not want to take that leap of faith and go into the unfamiliar, the uninvestigated territory. And that is what life is all about to be able to take that step so that we can grow. And the growth will only take place from the unfamiliar. It will never take place from what we are familiar with. That's why we ask this question. When was the last time you did something new? Thus the work of aura building. He felt more of an Sorry. Yes, right. He felt more affinity with the spirit woman than his own physical mother at those times. In his struggle not to incarnate, he would throw energy uh, out the sacral chakra and to the right to avoid growing roots straight down through the root chakra, the first chakra. He was able to do this partly because of the auric hole left from the spinal tap. After a time of struggle, he would again connect with his guide and calm down, open the route and start the incoming process again. So again, any kind of injuries that we have can leave a hole through which the auric field starts leaking, right? So it's very important to plug these holes, to plug these loops. We talk about a way that is there which we can use in the, again, the energy uh, and Vastu workshop where you have to turn in every direction to close it. Of course, we found easier methods to do it, but that is one of the methods which actually closes that uh, leak that we, uh, we have 
in our energy system. I tried to give him healing the first time he accepted some, but after that he refused. Whenever I tried to send energy into his aura, he made a fuss. He knew what I was up to and wouldn't let me get near him. What I tried to do was to sew the hole in the sacral chakra on the seventh layer of his aura and redirect the energy downward. So again, there are methods of being able to perceive where the leaks are and to actually seal them. He wouldn't allow it. I even approached him when he was in deep sleep. When I got to a distance of about one foot, he would wake up and scream fiercely. It was clearly a deep struggle and he wanted no one to help him with it. One of the secondary physical problems arising from this basic struggle was an intestinal problem from the constant overuse of the solar plexus chakra associated with screaming and crying. He was treated for this problem after he finally made his choice to stay in the physical plane. The astrological chart of this child clearly shows him to be a potential leader. So again, whenever we are stressed out, it will cause a certain imbalance in our system and cause a physical, a emotional and a mental uh, implication in our body system. That's why managing our stress becomes extremely important. And it starts from when we are babies, right? So that's why managing or allowing a baby to handle stress and that also depends on our nature. How are we relating to the child becomes very important. So in this case, the child was not connecting with his physical mother, which caused the stress in his system. So the incoming soul often enters and leaves the body through the crown chakra as it begins working on opening the root chakra to grow roots into the physical plane. The root chakra looks like a very narrow funnel and the crown chakra looks like a very wide funnel at this stage. The other chakras look like small shallow Chinese teacups with a narrow line of energy leading back into the body to the spine. The general field of a baby is amorphous, formless and has a bluish or grayish color. So again, the, since the field has not formed clearly, right, or the physical form is not formed clearly, the auric field is also a little fuzzy. And as it grows, it will start to systemic. I think we can stop here just now. Anyone, anything to say? 